Our next speaker is Mark Brunson. He's professor and head of the Department of Environment and Society here at Utah State University. His research and writing focus primarily on human dimensions of forest and rangeland science and management, including studies of public perceptions regarding wildlands and their management, communication and behavior, uh, change strategies, and the dynamics of coupled human, na human natural systems in arid and semi-arid semi environments. Please welcome Dr. Brunson. So I, I uh, this is one of those cases where the instructions I got from the organizer of this conference were vague enough um, that it gave me too much latitude. Um, and so I, I apologize. So I, I <clears throat> The way this came up is, as Darren mentioned, we were asked to sort of think forward. So, you know, don't just give a talk that says, here's what I studied last, um, but to, uh, to look forward and, and see if you could figure out the, the future. And <clears throat> I, um, I didn't really think about what that meant until Libby uh, Salmon asked me what the title of my talk was. And I didn't really have a whole lot of time to decide what I was going to say, but I needed a title, so this was it. And I was influenced at the time by a presentation by a philosopher, um, Dr. Brian Norton at, at Georgia Tech, that I heard at the Ecological Society of America. So I'm going to, um, that's where the myth and metaphor come from. But I'm not actually going to, I'm also going to show some data, because uh, one of the things that happens when you're a social scientist working among natural scientists is you have to show that you can gather data. Um, <laughs> and also, because I'm, I'm not really a social scientist. I, I love when Bob was trying to describe, you know, the eco-hydrology and how it emerged as a discipline, you know, and it's like, because I don't believe that the discipline I have has emerged yet. And, um, <laughs> I'm, you know, as Josh mentioned, I'm I'm, a, I'm interested really in the dynamics of coupled natural and human systems, particularly what's going on in those, in those interaction points and, and where human behavior um, influences environments and why humans behave in ways that do influence environments. And so I've variously called myself a conservation ecologist a, or psychologist, a human ecologist, a socio-eco-psychologist, um, I, you know, which it, it changes from day to day. So with that, now that I've thoroughly confused you and, and you know that I'm undisciplined, it's probably time for me to start. Um, so what I'm going to do today actually is, uh, this is how you know it's a human dimensions talk because there's people in it. Um, and I don't believe there's any, again, um, at least not except as cartoons. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is, is I'm going to do some philosophical musing, not too much because I know that... Um, a lot of little of that goes a long way. Um, I'm going to show some evidence to support what I have been suggesting and what I'm about to say at the end, which is I'm going to offer some lessons that we've gotten from some of the initial data of, and the thoughts, the sort of studies I've been doing of the human dimensions of restoration over the last decade or so, and some suggestions about what it means. And to sort of give you, to skip you to the end a little bit, what I'm going to suggest is that Restoration is a fuzzy enough topic that there is going to be some room for negotiation about where we end up and why we end up there. And that if we are to successfully go about the task of restoring the West, that ultimately what we're going to have to do is to find ways to involve the people of the West in setting those, um, those goals within the guidelines, within, within the, the constraints posed by science and some, um, some sort of overarching assumptions about why we're doing this and where we should get to. Uh, so I was struck, and I have always been struck by this conference now. This is the fourth time um, that it's been held, the second time I've been asked to be a speaker, for probably the last. And... Um, <laughs> because I'm about to, to make fun of it. Um, <laughs> honestly, this task of restoring the West, I mean, how ambitious 
a title is that for a seminar series. Or actually, the best word I could think of is a Yiddish word. You know, how much chutzpah is associated with the idea of restoring the West? And so this idea, is this an even possible thing? And, and I was fast, I started looking for people who discuss whether restoration is in fact a mythic objective, whether it is something one can actually do. And one of the fascinating, the question is raised a lot, but it's almost always raised by people like those of us in this room. It's raised by restoration ecologists. It's written in places like, um, like ecological restoration or restoration ecology journals like that, um, or by philosophers and um, other people who sort of think about the place of natural science and conservation in, in over in larger society. So, um, for example, this book, uh, Restoring Nature, which appeared about a decade ago, and I've, I've got a chapter in here, uh, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit about what I said in that later, but this, it was um, relatively popular, you know, book among the 13 people who read that sort of thing, and um, at the time, you know, but basically it was, well, is restoration really restoration? You can't go back and, you know, these kinds of sort of hand-wringing questions about what we're doing. Um, and here's a, here's a much more recent example. This comes from Cliff Duke, who is the director of science programs in the Ecological Society of America. And in this uh, ESA blog, he says, okay, restoration implies something that modern ecology denies. You know, ecosystems don't work that way. We can't go back to something. Irreversible change is the rule, not the exception in living systems. And, you know, so this idea that that restoration is, is in some ways um, an ideal but not, not a possibility, a sort of mythic concept, is one that, that occasionally appears in the literature of people like us. And then the Duke's response in the, in the blog came from, from George Gann, who at that time was, I think, executive vice president of the Society for Ecological Restoration. And he says, ah, it's ridiculous. Eco ecosystems can be restored. They are being restored. Are these exactly like they were pre-disturbance? Of course they aren't. Why should we expect them to be? Neither ecological theory nor the broad practice of restoration would lead us to think that this would be possible, much less desirable. Okay, fine. I can agree with that. That makes a lot of sense to me. It fits with my understanding of ecology. It fits my understanding of the need for restoration. It doesn't necessarily fit the understanding of the citizens who think we're bringing the world back to some pristine or prior condition. Um, and so this idea of, well, it may or may not fit with what people's expectations are, led me to move from the concept of myth to the concept of metaphor. Here's where I am indebted to the work of Brian Norton. And, and as I mentioned, he's a philosopher, uh, although he's in a policy department at Georgia Tech, and he's written several books about sustainability and what is it and can we find it and what are we sustaining it, for whom are we sustaining it. You know, questions that, that many of us have been to, to talks um, you know, uh, about those kinds of topics. And this was at, at ESA at a conference um, at a symposium called, I think, Restoration of What and for Whom. Um, and what he suggested, which I really liked, is that is that sustainability was a metaphor. And not the kind of metaphor that you learn about in fourth grade where, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, sort of like a simile only without the like. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's... it's but, but what he's talking about is a conceptual metaphor, a way for us to understand an abstract concept, a complicated concept with lots of different nuances that restoration ecologists or restoration practitioners may understand or scientific practitioners may understand. But, you know, and so we give some more concrete, more physical, more tangible concept. And so we talk about things like ecosystem health. And Commissioner Blackham talked about landscape health to begin this. Well, we don't, you know, health is a metaphor. We don't, you know, we don't necessarily know how to monitor. We don't have, you know, we don't have a blood pressure kind of equivalent for landscape health. 
where you know we can just fairly easily measure something and say, okay, yeah, you're good, you're bad, you know, you know, call the funeral home, whatever it might be. Um, ecosystem management is one again. You know, it's we I used to give a annually be asked to give a session where we talk about the definition of ecosystem management. People would always say, you can't manage ecosystems. You know, and I would say, well, no, it's managing as if ecosystems matter. Uh, but again, that means that there's a metaphor there. Sustainability is a metaphor. How, how do you know whether you've sustained something? You know, what's it measured in? What's the units? Ecological footprint. The one we, every time, if you try and calculate your carbon footprint before, you know, it's like this is a big thing with science conference these days. Figure out what your carbon footprint is and then give us some money or something or plant 13 trees because you drove 37 miles and, you know, all these kinds of little hand wringing things that we do because we know that in order for us to do our job, we have to um, damage the thing which we strive to conserve. Um, and so, but those footprint calculators, every single one of them is different. Because the idea of a footprint is fundamentally just a metaphor for some larger concept. And I would argue that restoration is one as well. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of an aside here. This, it turns out this is not, I thought this was going to work, but you obviously can't read this. Um, this is a diagram from, from a s software poster, software designer's poster. Okay, what's he talking about? So the, I'll, I'll read these things. The upper left-hand corner going across. So the thing there with the three the, the swing with the three different boards on it is how the customer explained it. The one board is how the project leader understood it, but if you notice, the, the tree is in the way, so it's not actually going to swing anywhere. The analyst designed it um, in a really complex way. Uh, the programmer wrote it so that it won't actually do anything. The business consultant described it in a much more glowing term, so now we have an easy chair hanging from the tree. The project was documented well. Um, you know, if you ask what Dean Fraser said, it was also how you monitored the success of it. What operations installed was just half of it, um, the, the rope part. Uh, how the customer was built. Uh, <laughs> um, then we have how it was supported and what the customer really needed was a tire swing. And, and I, I used this, why did I choose software design? Because I read this, I, I I don't know if anybody reads books because they're in the Oprah book club. Um, this is part of how America works right now. If Oprah says do it, we do. And, um, and so there's, I was reading a, a really excellent book that I just finished a couple days ago, a novel called The Story of Edgar Sautel. I don't know if anyone's read it yet. Um, but at the end of those Oprah book club trade paperbacks, you pay twice as much for just because, um, because they're serious novels. Uh, at the end, they have these interviews. And they interviewed David Robleski, who wrote the book, and he's, he's made his living as a software designer. And he pointed out, which makes sense to me, that nothing software designers do, every term they use is a metaphor. Because no one would understand what software designers do. You know? And so we have, and we all use these all the time. When you load a Windows on your computer, that's not a window. It's not something you see through. It's, you know, it's a metaphor for a whole bunch of computer connections and, you know, and things firing. You know, I, this is why I'm not an electrical engineer. I, um, <laughs> but regardless, you know, but we, we can understand it as a window. It appears vaguely like that, you know, and we use all these other kinds of terms. You know, you have things in a queue, you have... Um, you have portals, web portals, all these things that aren't really what they say they are, but we understand them better that way. And that's what we do in science as well. And so concepts like sustainability or restoration are metaphors because they focus on a few definable, understandable goals that we, you know, in hopes of reaching a broader one that we can't precisely define. We don't necessarily know, especially if you can't go back. We don't really know what this future that we're shooting for is. But we have a few definable goals that can describe, and we hope will, you know, that we can describe where we have a pretty good chance we're going to get to, and we hope will encompass the other, you know, all the other components of the system that we are trying to, quote, restore. Uh, but we had all kinds of imprecision in measuring the outcomes. 
Do we measure communities or do we just measure key species? Uh, and if we do the latter, do we risk missing important species we didn't really think about? Uh, do the processes have to occur at scales typical for natural systems? Or can they occur at a smaller scale? Can we do site level restoration or is that just, you know, sort of gardening? Um, how long must we monitor? And, you know, Dean Fraser says we don't, but how long do we have to monitor before we decide a site has been restored? You know, uh, these are the kinds of questions that we wrestle with. We don't have answers. We go on forth anyway because we know that we need to get it done. Is that precision necessarily a bad thing? Well, yes and no. It does leave projects open to political reinterpretation. Because when we do not have precise, very clear descriptions of what it is we're shooting for, then there are going to be, just like the software designer heard it different from the production manager, heard it different from the marketing people, we're going to have slightly different visions, ways that we process that information and expectations, and then there will be people who will exploit those things. If we strive for a generalization, all right, then maybe then, given that there's some of this, uh, this fuzz at the other end of our, in our future, maybe it's okay to ask for help in filling in the details, in part because it allows us to get citizens buy-in to the things that we're trying to achieve. And fundamentally, when we're talking about restoring the West, restoring the Great Basin, we're mostly talking about working on public lands. And for public lands, it's ethical for us to do identify the outcomes that are sought by the public owners to some extent. We have jobs because the public wants us to do the things that we are doing. They may have different ideas about what it is. They may not want us to do all of the things we're doing. But fundamentally, we're not paid by the ecosystems we're restoring. We're paid by the people. And so we need to have the goals affirmed. We need to have some reassurance that the direction we're going is achieving the objectives that the people who pay us are asking us to achieve, knowing those are going to differ across stakeholder categories. And as citizen preferences are infeasible or they won't achieve the desired outcomes, then it helps us to understand why we have chosen the direction we have and what the outcomes might be of going in a direction that someone else suggests. So we need to have a dialogue. And that's where I hope to, to help when we get to the future part. This kind of dialogue is where I think we can go effectively. All right, so what kinds of disputed meanings might you find? I just, for the heck of it, I started Googling restoration and um, negative, just those two words. And then I looked for things that I could find um, a couple days ago. And I found this thing from the Capital Press, which is a, a um, really well-read agricultural newspaper. Triple threat to ag, development, restoration, and climate issues might mount. So restoration is, 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 a, is a threat to agriculture, according to this article. Um, or... On the other hand, we hear restoration is just doing what agriculture wants. So this comes from Western Watersheds Project. Burning, mowing, chopping, disking, even herbiciding, old growth, sagebrush are routine BLM and Forest Service activities carried out in the name of restoration. This sagebrush killing is identical to livestock forage projects of the past. It's just called something else. Um, and that's, this is a particular criticism that those of us in the Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Program, you know, which we say is a restoration experiment, uh, have heard from, from the Western Watersheds folks. Um, and this is not just something that happens in the Great Basin. This, this is a picture of uh, now the Chicago Wilderness. I don't know how many people have heard of the Chicago Wilderness concept. It seems a little odd. Um, but there's a whole movement in the Chicago metro area and the sort of greater northeast Illinois area to restore some of the prairies that had pretty much been transferred, transmitted to something else. And this comes from one of the first um, publications of their magazine, Chicago Wilderness Magazine. 
And, and I like the way she, um, this Deborah Shore wrote this because it really talks about the difficulties in restoring landscapes like much of the Great Basin that, <clears throat> that aren't going to resonate with people's visions of what pure nature should be. To many of our neighbors, she writes, prairies seem foreign and unattractive, second cousin to the trash-filled vacant lot. The Midwest Sea of Grass, a rich mosaic of prairies, oak woods, and marshes was virtually eradicated within the span of a single human lifetime. Because there was so little left, it's not easy to know the prairie, and therefore it's not very easy to love it. So we grew up, Midwesterners, but it's the same true for us, we grew up with gorgeous images of Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, displayed before us. This was nature resplendent. This was true nature, fine and pure. No one told us about the prairies. No one told us about the sagebrush. But it was in the prairies that modern humanity would learn a shocking secret about nature. Leaving nature alone isn't enough. Leave prairie alone and we lose it. And so what they were doing is they were removing trees. And this was where the controversy was. They were trying to restore grasslands. They were restoring, they were taking away some of the wetland drains that are, that are present all through the Midwest and, and restoring wetlands. And people were, no, this isn't what we wanted. This isn't what we thought Chicago wilderness would be. We thought Chicago wilderness would be something else. Um, something prettier, something more like Yosemite. <coughs> um, and, and so we have to explain about mountains, but that's, um, okay. Enough about philosophy. Um, I showed this slide two years ago um, when I spoke in this room on this stage to this group. Um, and I had at the time a hypothesis which I had not yet tested, which is that the beliefs about the need for restoration, how people perceived the process and the processes that had caused that which we were now going to <coughs> miss to change direction on, we're going to be believed on people's beliefs about the naturalists or present or prior conditions. So people were not going to want to approve restoration if they thought that the direction we were headed on was a good one. And so I, I showed this picture, that um, this paired comparison that Robin Tausch took in Nevada where you, know, you can see how the... the um, let's try again. Aha! Okay, so nice, simple. You know, many of you have seen this photo uh, of, you know, we've got the pinion and the juniper filling in very nicely, you might think, or very um, evilly, you might think, <coughs> you know, over, over a 30-year period. And this is one of those things that we in the Sage Step group hold up as why we need to restore sagebrush ecosystems. We're losing sagebrush, which, by the way, is a really hard um, argument to make to people who've driven from Wendover to uh, Reno. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've gone from 100 million acres to 65 million acres. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay. And so I wondered, and the same thing, and I, I, this is the second slide I drew from that same talk. I wondered, well, would we expect the same response? Would people say the same thing about an increase of pinion juniper woodland? Would they say the same thing about an increase in uh, Douglas fir? So these are uh, two shots taken actually almost in, in identical spot. Uh, in, in the Whitetail Basin just east of Butte, where I've also got a research project. And here, the encroaching species is not juniper, it's Douglas fir. You know, and I went to Oregon State University, got a forestry degree. I was taught that Douglas fir is God's perfect organism, right? <laughs> and here we are, we're getting rid of it. We actually set fire to a bunch of riparian Douglas fir to try and reduce the canopy so we could affect the eco-hydrologic conditions in this watershed. And create something like this on the right would be, you know, because that's what we say is right, because that's what was there. You know, how's that going to resonate with the people who've moved into that neighborhood? So this is, these are the questions I had. Um, so what did we do? Well, we did some, I have, I mentioned two studies. I'm going to mention a little bit of data from two projects. One is a uh, Sage Step project. It's, uh, you'll hear again things from Sage Step scientists during the course of this. Um, Great Basin-wide experiment to uh, assess response to restoration of fuels reduction treatments. We have a very large array of disciplines, including social science. And, and 
So one of the things I did was I did some in-depth interviews of managers and stakeholders about, and the stakeholders from different groups, about restoration. What is it? How should it be done? Do we think that the agencies have the capacity to do it? Um, and then in the Whitetail Basin study that I just mentioned, this was a little simpler experiment, only in the one place. But again, we measured you know, sort of human responses to burning Douglas fir to restore sage step. So I did some surveys, or well, I didn't. The grad student did it. I stood by and say, "Here's what you do," you know. I'll take credit, and um, <coughs> and uh, did some surveys of citizens and counties where we had Douglas fir and sagebrush, so we might expect them to uh, to have that kind of encroachment. And in the second study, we basically gave them this. One of the things we did is we gave them this question. So we're going to show you four photographs of landscape scenes that are typical of Rocky Mountain region. Using this scale from minus four to plus four, please rate the acceptability of each scene as a view you might see as out the window of your home. Circle the best answer. And then here's what we got. What we did is we first gave them a somewhat restored, you know, a mostly sagebrush dominated, it was black and white, I couldn't afford color, um, <laughs> uh, black and white, for, you know, say somewhat um, sagebrush dominated landscape, not a whole lot of trees. And the mean was 0 0.3, so essentially, Neither acceptable nor unacceptable. Uh, now we add here, now we throw in some junipers. And we have a slightly, you know, and people thought that was a better landscape. Now we'll just take the junipers out and we'll put Douglas fir in instead. Um, and then finally, now we have them both in there. And so basically the same scene, Photoshop. And you'll notice that the, um, that the scene is getting more acceptable as we add trees, which shouldn't really surprise anybody. It was also fascinating to me that at least with this particular description of what you might see in, in a, in a um, sort of arid montane environment is that uh, there was really no difference in people's responses to juniper and to Douglas fir. Ah, well, hmm. But I've, we've been raised here to hate juniper, you know, and it's, uh, or at least juniper outside of its place. Which brings us to the next, well, and then this was the highest one, but that brings us to the next question. Juniper in and out of place. Juniper has to know its place, okay. Um, well, this is how we talk in ecology and restoration. Um, so we use these terms very carefully. We talk about invasion to mean non-native organisms, bad plants that don't belong. Encroachment is when native organisms don't know their place, right? And they begin to go where we don't think they should be. And if we don't care, and they're native, or if we like it, then we call it expansion. <laughs> okay? And, and, and there are a lot of people who are really concerned about using these terms. Okay, so what I wanted to know, and what actually um, Cameron Nay, the grad student who worked on this, with this is his favorite part of the study, was does this combat metaphor we use does it resonate with citizens? Does framing the issue in this way affect, influence how people believe the need for restoration? And what did we find out? Well, here's one way of looking at it. In this case, in this diagram, what we've done is we've given them that same minus four to plus four scale, and we gave them how acceptable is it to remove trees as a restoration practice if the objective is da 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 da. And, you know, so if it's to improve ecosystem health, Another metaphorical objective, what happens? That's the, the, the most acceptable reason to remove trees, if it makes things healthier. And there is a slight difference here so that it's more acceptable if it's an invaded landscape than if it's an expanded landscape. So if the trees are expanding and we need to remove them, uh, it's a little more acceptable if it's invaded. But in every single one of these other cases, there is no statistical difference between expansion, encroachment, and invasion. This, this um, metaphor really doesn't, this, this idea of combat, really doesn't resonate with the ordinary citizen randomly selected households in places where this might happen. Now you'll notice here that as you sort of go down in the levels of acceptability, and all of them are acceptable, um, but you know, wildlife habitat is good, fuel hazard is good to remove fuel hazard, then you have a sort of a, a and increasing water yields, all of those are roughly the same. You get a slightly lower level for, to do it for scenic beauty or livestock forage, but the least acceptable reason was to restore pre-settlement conditions. So if it's just because we want to go back where we were, without these other objectives, what happens? People are like, eh, whatever, 
I could take it or leave it. That's not that important to me. And so the message there is, a re- and also the, mess- the other lesson I draw from that is people make a distinction between restoration and health. And it makes sense because we do all kinds, we, we alter all kinds of things in our bodies to restore health or to, to improve health. We don't necessarily want to restore the precondition. <laughs> in fact, you know, usually that's, never mind. Um, <laughs> okay, another way of looking at this. Now we've just got, um, you know, how you view this, what's, what's the most favorable to least favorable system. So here a lower number means people view it more favorably. And we only had those three. <laughs> So does it matter how the trees are removed? Well, yeah. Prescribed burning is people's favorite way of doing it. There's no difference between rural and urban people here. Felling conifers with a chainsaw is a little, you know, roughly, I, I didn't do the multiple range analysis to look at the, direct, the um, evaluation in the other direction, but the herbicides were the least favorable. But notice that this is the only one where urban people and rural people differed. And this becomes one of our challenges as well, right? Because there are a lot more urban people in the West, but there are a lot more, uh, but the people who, the rural people are much more likely to be affected by the decisions we make. So now we see the lesson is, uh, first of all, the most efficient method to achieve the goal, in many cases applying herbicides is the best way to, you know, not necessarily for removing trees, but, um, but for some cases, applying herbicides is the, least, is the most efficient way to achieve our objectives. But I've done this with rangeland wheat studies as well, and we get the same exact response. You know, so effectiveness is not necessarily the same as what people want us to use. Um, the other thing is that there's a difference between rural and urban citizens, and we need to think about that. Um, also, to give you a little bit of the, what we went on in the interviews, all, I mentioned four stakeholder groups and managers. We interviewed managers, Recreation interests, livestock interests, um, education extension folks, and environmental group folks. And we, we tried to identify a spectrum of people. And what we found is everybody said the Great Basin rangelands need to be restored. But their reasons were different. So some people were saying, well, we need to restore them to avoid certain endangered species listing because that's going to make it impossible to, uh, to graze uh, or something like that. Other people say, because it's the right thing to do. So even though restoration is important to a lot of groups, there may be differences in how they perceive why we're doing it, and that may lead us to um, differences in how they think we ought to do it. Um, they'll consider any tool. Most people said, yeah, I would consider, you know, under right circumstances, I'd consider you using any tool, but we'd really rather use fire because fire is nature's way of restoring landscapes. Um, and this one was really interesting. The one place where managers and stakeholders really differ Different is that the managers liked big treatments for a couple of reasons. I think one is is because that's the scale which disturbance occurs, and also because it takes just as much NEPA to do a little project as a big project. <laughs> uh, so you know, <laughs> uh, interest groups on the other hand, they're really cons- they don't believe that we really know what we're doing, so they like it to be the smallest possible treatment in order to be able to achieve the objective. You know, much more surgical. Okay, so what do I learn from this? One is that citizens differ from scientists and managers in what they understand, you know, where we've come from, what, what the prior condition, where we, should, where we should go, how we should get there, who should benefit. The implication is that we should be careful with our assumptions about the rightness of restoration. I like to use the example of the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, which used to be an army base um, southwest of Chicago. And, you know, so it's like this little forest service area that's tucked in between a landfill and an industrial park and an army proving ground. And, um, you know, but they're going to restore tall grass prairie. And when they, and everybody said, this is a great idea. Congress helped facilitate it. But then where we ended up with a problem, and I'll discuss in a minute, is how, what restoration really meant and what the citizens thought and what the, Prairie ecologists thought it was not the same thing. Uh, citizens differ among themselves in what they understand about restoration. Rural urban differences matter, connections to interest groups matter, um, and they also differ in their trust levels about science and land management. And part of what we need to be able to do is earn and keep their trust. And how do you do that? Well, 
interactive outreach approaches are probably a really good way to make that happen. Um, Eric Tolman, uh, who's now at Ohio State, graduate student, uh, who's an undergrad of, uh, researcher of mine, a grad student of Bruce Schindler's at Oregon State, did a study for his dissertation where he found that information is trusted more if it's delivered in an interactive setting where you get to figure out who the deliverer is and you get to, you know, sort of get a feel for who that person might be. Uh, this is a great example I saw recently. I was down in, I was driving to Flagstaff a couple weeks ago and, and uh, stopped in Kanab for, um, to, for some energy. And, um, <laughs> and one of the things I found was this invitation for uh, the day before for, you know, join rangeland management specialist Brian Taylor as he guides you to areas where various vegetative treatments were applied to restore biodiversity. So this is an ATV ride with the range specialist who's now going to show restoration practices. Uh, and that's a really good idea because it reaches out and says, come do the things that you like doing and let's really participate as a group and see if we can figure out what's going on. And yet very often restoration occurs as a way to um, forestall the effects of ATV riding. Um, people trust scientists and managers more if we're humanized by face-to-face -face contact. Okay, so that means we're the experts, but we have to think about what that, you know, we, we're perfectly willing to tell ourselves we don't know where we're going. We're not so sure to tell other people about that. Also, sometimes citizens have information that can help us if we're open to listening to it. You know, there's a lot of people who have been places we haven't been, have been there more often. And of course, most Western Range and Forest Lands are managed for public benefits, so that's important too. And that leads me to sort of where I'm, the last few things I want to suggest about how we can get there. And again, I'm borrowing from a book, because I haven't any original ideas, I guess. Um, so this is uh, Brian Walker and David Salt. This is uh, it's a book called Resilience Thinking. I would recommend to everybody uh, as a great way of thinking about how we can understand, manage, uh, manage and restore and maintain coupled, sustain coupled systems. And the theorists in the Resilience Alliance suggest that systems can withstand surprises under various surprises, unusual stochastic events. If feedbacks are tighter between the land and the manager, this is where the, the monitoring comes in, and between the manager and the constituents, and that you want to build social capital, um, which is built through trust, networks, careful listening. So how do they suggest you do it? Well, one way, this comes from the, uh, this is from Sweden, from Christianstad, um, the Eco Museum, Christianstads Vatnerika. I have no idea how to speak Swedish, but neither do you. Um, <laughs> and this wetland over here is what they're trying to restore. And so what did they do? Well, they created this Eco Museum. They created a permanent forum for stakeholders to interact. It was created in 1988. It, it, it convenes occasionally. People go out. They monitor together. It was organized by a neutral third party, by the city of Christianstadt. It was not uh, organized by environmentalists or anything, anybody else. And the folks are given real tasks. They're asked to assist with mapping, with monitoring. And then they occasionally are convened to address specific issues. Like, this, like one of them was crane depredation on, on agricultural fields surrounding the marshes. Second example, different approach. Um, this is in the Northern Highland Lakes District of Washington. Uh, Steve Carpenter and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, not Washington, W's, whatever, they're all, if you're a Westerner, you dub as Washington, it's Wisconsin. They basically, what they did is they came up with four scenarios. Here's what could happen, what might happen, and now let's collaboratively talk about what that means. And so they created this opportunity, again, for citizen scientists dialogue where people could say, if we go along this path, here's where we might end up, where we think we're likely to end up. Do you like that? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? That alternative futures modeling is used a lot in sort of urban or bioregional planning, not so much in sort of restoration planning, but I think it could be. And finally, this is actually what I wrote about in that On Restoration book. Uh, it was the chapter that was least mentioned in all the book reviews um, because I didn't philosophize at all. I talked about what a process that might work. Basically what I did is I borrowed from the limits of acceptable change wilderness planning process. I suggested that we recognize that occasionally there are going to be conflicting goals. There's a goal of restoration. There's a goal of maintaining something important. 
and let's figure out how far we can deviate from that goal of restoration and still get where we want to get. And so, again, to go back to the Medewan National Grassland, what we got here, this is Osage Orange growing here. These hedges of Osage Orange that were planted are part of a cultural landscape that are really important to the people living in this area. And when they found out that, remove, that restoring prairie was going to be removing the Osage Orange hedgerows, people weren't happy. And so the question that I had was, well, can you begin to talk about what the consequences of this might be and where we can leave the Osage Orange and where we have to remove it? And you can begin to negotiate these kinds of things. And basically that leads me to the last slide, luckily, because I'm at the end of my time. Uh, this is really where I think we need to end up. We have to recognize we don't know all the answers. We have to be humility, we have to be humble enough to ask other people what they think while recognizing that we know things they don't. And lots of people know things I don't, so I do want to thank a few people. Um, this talk drove on, you know, derived these collaborators that I've been working with on these issues for quite a while. I want to thank them. Got some money to help do this research, and I want to thank um, Darren and, and the rest of the organizers for allowing me to bend your ear for 45 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, right. How, how do you, I mean, you talk about some ways to link science to you know, the community or citizens, I should say, but how do you see better linking social sciences to the ecological sciences and some of the management grounds that more lean on ecological science than social sciences? I think there's a divide here in some ways or a lack of integration <coughs> that limits some of the abilities to do some of the things that you're talking about. Um, so Ron's question was basically, yeah, so I'm talking about ecologists and working with citizens, but there's also a question about whether the social scientists who are studying the human system are really very well integrated with the ec ecological scientists who are studying the natural system. And, and you know, that's the new <coughs> discipline that I'm hoping uh, to be one of the first people in, <coughs> sort of coupled system science Kind of thing. There, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, the NSF is really pushing that right now, this idea that we should be able to study how these systems interrelate. One of the things I think is that we need to have, I hate to say it, but more effective models of how these systems fit together. But I also think that we need s theories that work in both social and natural systems. And one theory, um, that I really, you know, that comes up a lot is this idea of resources and resource fluctuation, resource availability. We use that more and more to understand how um, plant communities develop and respond to disturbance. Uh, human communities do the same thing. You know, we make, you know, we make decisions based on resource availability. So that, that's one possible way, but you know, when you ask a question that really is sort of at the center of my, my life's thinking right now, I probably should shut up before I keep going. <laughs> sir? It seems like we're working on all this app now in the courts. Yes, sir. How do we get out of that so we can do this and, as you're talking, and cooperative uh, between each other instead of the court? The, the thing about, I mean, you're really asking... Commissioner, and I, I, I've despaired over this as probably almost as much as you have. We're really asking for a fundamental change in the culture of how we think about interactions between arguing parties. You know, um, our whole society, I feel, is getting more and more about, I want it all. And so we have this, the, the, the conflict theories have this term called BATNA best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And as long as the courts are out there, someone's going to want to swing that bat <coughs> and beat the other side with it. Um, I honestly believe that we need to come up with some legislated way to, on a trial basis, test new sort of legal frameworks that remove the incentives to go to court and increase the incentives to collaborate. Um, 
the example that I have often used is the you know, state and federal government don't always agree. You may have noticed that. I'm not sure. Um, Utah Partners for Conservation and Development. Um, so when, when the Milford Flat fire occurred, those folks who were already talking, were already prepared, had already thought about how, what can the state do better than the feds? What can the feds do better than the state? So when Milford Flat burned, largest fire in, in recorded Utah history, they, people were ready to start thinking about how to make this happen. They didn't have to sit around and do, you know, wait for the NEPA to decide whether we could, you know, chain here or do this kind of thing. You know, people shared resources to be able to get the archaeological clearances done. To me, that's the model. Now, there are some mistakes made in Milford Flat. There are some things that shouldn't have happened or didn't happen the way we thought they would. But fundamentally, I think we got a whole lot farther through collaboration than if we'd sat around arguing for three years how we should go about it. Nick, one more brief question. So yeah. What, what role does education play <clears throat> What role does education play in pre preventing no, in facilitating, in facilitating uh, conversation? Um, <laughs> I this is part of why I think I mean we are trained to speak unintelligibly, <laughs> um, and one of the things that we need to figure out in the academy, in, in universities, and in in, uh, in research organizations is how to allow the reward system to let us speak in terms that other people can understand, speak metaphorically. Because I think, I think education is critical, but people have got way too much t information coming at them that they pick and choose the information they either think is most important or that confirms their pre-existing beliefs, right? So we have to somehow get people out of that system. And the only way I could see that I can get people to want to listen to me instead of to, um, you know, to Keith Olbermann or Glenn Beck is if I make it more fun than they do. And that means speaking differently. It means going on an ATV ride so you can educate people. Um, but fundamentally, I think we are at once a more and less educated society than we were um, a decade ago. And the process is getting worse all the time. So on that depressing note, <laughs> I think it's there's, there's a break. There's coffee and pastries.